It has been five years since I've come to the Barber Museum and it is paradise. Actually, maybe it's been six years. Either way, let's enjoy ourselves. In the middle of the facility is this fantastic, you can't quite see it, but it's this wonderful elevator that is just lined with motorcycles. Look at that. With the cascading, it has kind of a circular cascading stairway or walkway, actually. There's no stairs involved. Even better, it's very similar to the Mercedes-Benz Stuttgart Museum. If you've ever been there, you'll notice it's a very similar design. <gasps> Look at this, guys. So we're gonna go to the top floor and then make our way down. I'm gonna, oh, it's just so nice in here. I'm gonna flip the screen. Would you just look? Ah, oh, it really doesn't even look real. It just, mm -mm. So I think it was 2014. I came here and I had the whole day to spend and it was just, Positively magic. gate we have this lovely 1975 Harley Davidson Air Mach-E and Air Mach-E was kind of a really interesting time period for Harley Davidson so they saw all these foreign competitors selling their motorcycles for cheap and they thought we need to figure out an easy way to make some sprint racers and so they bought Air Mach-E which was an Italian I think it was aviation planes that they were making at the time and so they bought Air Mach-E and I don't remember how long they owned it but that, when you see a Har Harley Davidson air mocky, it's a little story behind it. I know you're on a road. Sweet honey. This sick and real soon. cool guys right behind me there is a 1964 Harley Davidson Servi car now Servi car right there that's an indicator it was used primarily as a service vehicle this is was a police it's been restored it looks really nice but it was used pretty heavily uh, for the police force and the Servi car interesting fact was the first electric start for Harley Davidson Come on. scooter right behind me is 1954 Moto Rumi and apparently during World War II they were building torpedoes you know working for the war effort so after World War II like a lot of other manufacturers they dove into scooters I had never heard of one before Come along. on that same note right behind me is a 1964 Heinkel I think I'm saying that right tourist and same thing this was a German aviation company, but right after the war, they were not sanctioned to produce any airplanes. Same thing that happened to Messerschmitt and how you got the Messerschmitt KR-175 and KR-200. This is the Henkel, which apparently was top quality and performance, but it proved to be a little too expensive for the European market at the time. You gotta feel it. I really need to get out of the Vespa area because I'm gonna spend all my time here and I only have three hours before they close. Now another thing.
thing I want to point out is that why scooters were so popular after World War II is because you didn't have to have a driver's license. All you needed was a motorcycle license, and that was clutch. turn of the century motorcycles. Would you just look at that? It's art. It's a piece of artwork. There's going to be more. This place is very, very chock full. I need to hurry. But I'm just taking my sweet time and I have four more and I'm actually five more levels that I need to get to. BMW R90S and with this motorcycle BMW really started competing against the super bikes of its time. This is in Daytona orange which is lovely. Now the one thing is while this could compete against the other super bikes it was also something absolutely magical about BMW's designs in the 20s and 30s. Look at that. <laughs> oh, it's just hot. So the neat thing about this Suzuki right behind me is that it has a rotary engine. Those are kind of cool theirs are kind of rare, but this was also designed by Giorgetto Giugaro. I always hesitate if I'm getting his name right. So that's the same guy. He was prolific. That's the guy that did the Iso Griffo by Revolta. Um, that's, he also did the Di Tommaso Mangusta, the Lotus Esprit, um, which I have a video about the history of the Lotus, so you should check it out. Maybe I'll figure out and put a link up there. But uh, it's kind of interesting when you notice, when you note a designer's name. neat thing. Right behind me is a 1975 Boltaco Alpina 250. Who knows if I'm saying Boltaco properly or not. <laughs> but the neat thing about this, so this is, was a very popular enduro bike in North America, and it earned the nickname of Mountain Goat and Wood Wizard. I'm totally using Wood Wizard at another date. That's a nickname that sticks. So full disclosure, this is not my kind of cup of tea, you know what I mean? But, you know, I respect that other different tastes for different folks, different flavors, different anything. Now that's my cup of tea. Ducati just makes some darn good looking motorcycles. So this is highly desirable. Only 450 of the 750 SS were ever made. About the Harley Davidson Air Maki. And right here is the Air Maki that was before Harley purchased them. That would later lead to the sprint motorcycles of the Harley Davidson Air Maki. Right saying, but I remember this roof superior from my last visit six years ago. It's very nice, it's very quality, powered by a matchless engine. They touted it as the um, Rolls Royce of the motorcycle during its day, and T.E. Lawrence had five of these during his lifetime. Kind of cool. Okay, well, now I definitely remember this guy. This is a 1925 Bomberland. Once again, that is a tough thing to say, but these are kind of neat. They came in a lot of variety of colors. Ideally, there were supposed to be three people sitting tandem, and then you had the sidecar to boot. Now, they think maybe a thousand were built in between 1924 to 1939. 
think I got those dates right. Who knows? And who knows how many are in existence. This is the oldest one in existence. I just love it. just getting through one floor. I'm a little worried I'm not gonna make it through everywhere. That's my problem. I just, I'm a placard reader. I love it. And that's also how I know a lot of random little facts is from going to a bunch of museums and reading the placards like a maniac. So if I don't make it through today, I'll come back tomorrow when I'm done working. This area is new. This was not here. You know, a lot of people um, donate their motorcycles to the Barber Vintage Motorsports Museum. And that's, I guess, why they've had to expand because this whole section of the, uh, of the facility wasn't here last time. up to before they got into the tire business making these awesome scramblers all right guys so guess what kind of a nickname this sculpted gas tank had on this ducati 200 super sport It was nicknamed the Jello Mold. I'll get you a little closer to take a look at it, but you'll get the idea. Well, some of you might already see it. The Moto Guzzi 850 Le Mans. Considered one of the greatest Italian superbikes of its day. This is a 1913 James 3 speed with a little canoelet, as they call it, aka sidecar. Um, it's also kind of neat because it has acetylene um, lights on there, which is a very brass era thing, and this is a very brass era motorcycle. I just love it. <laughs>
the funk back. Augusta Sport 125. And you might be saying, I've never heard of an MV Augusta. Well, they didn't get imported that frequently into the States because of excessive import fees and costs just inflated it to where they were way too expensive. <laughs> that came out on this Norton Commando 850 were not popular when they first came out. And then they slowly became popular, but they got a lot, they incurred a lot of criticism at the time, and it's funny because now it's, it's popular and it's normal. So sometimes when you're too innovative, it's a little bit risky. <laughs> Teenager, my dad had a BMW R1150, and uh, it was pretty bad. So I have fond little childhood memories driving, uh, riding on the back of this to our mechanic shop, shooking her prices. <laughs> Observation. This color was very rare for them to put out. Some of you might be wondering, what is a Triton? Well, it is powered by a Triumph, but on the feather bed frame of a Norton. Kind of interesting. So those were the, the lightest frame and the fastest engines at the time. Czechoslovakian uh, motorcycle manufacturer. It was at the Lane Motor Museum, and that's actually when I think about it, they also have a ton of Tatros. They had a ton of Czech auto manufactured vehicles as well, so I just love my museums. Guys, it is day two at the Barber Museum. You can't, you, honestly, you cannot fit at all in one day. You're gonna get exhausted because it's so much. Let's go check it out. Move along. Come on. Vintage Motorsports Museum, they have the largest collection of Lotus cars 
Am I making you dizzy yet? Largest collection of Lotus cars. Oh, I think I just made myself dizzy. Uh, largest collection of Lotus cars in the USA. It's pretty rad. All right. And now the founder, Colin Chapman, his his motto was simplify and then add lightness and they dominated they did lotus did phenomenal in racing and it's still a beloved racer today you got a feeling yeah you got a that was actually sold to a customer. And the proceeds would really be used to create Lotus cars. So we have the Mark VI right behind me. And this is really considered Lotus's first production car. It, it did so well at the local racetracks that it started to sale and it's considered the first production Lotus. that Lotus cars really kind of got started as a hobby, all right? Colin Chapman had a job. It was just him and his buddies doing some work outside his girlfriend's garage. They took a 1930s Austin 7 and created what looks like behind, what looks like the mark of the Lotus Mark 1 behind me. Now, this is a replica. Cool story. Okay, so this is, without a doubt, my favorite floor, all right? This is the turn of the century. <gasps> Motorcycles. Oh, it's just fantastic. There are a few pieces, pieces of art, motorcycles that I remember from my last visit that I'm going to tell you about and you're going to really love them. Okay, so behind me is a Hildebrand and Wolfmuller, 1894, and it's considered the first production motorcycle, okay? This made its way to, shoot, Asia, Australia, okay? Before then, they hadn't seen that, anything like this before. It's got a horizontal twin cylinder, four stroke, and it can shoot out two and a half horsepower. It's kind of immaculate. And I'm gonna show you the... You're gonna like Maybach right wagon. All right, so this is a replica, of course, right behind me. But this is considered one of the first, these are the first motorcycles ever created. And on this, Maybach rode like two miles or so, reaching seven, seven miles per hour. Construction during its creation, both Maybach, Maybach, Maybach. I can't talk about a lot, a lot of excitement. You can tell. Both Maybach and Daimler invented a device that mixed both gasoline and air and called it a carburetor. Ah! So this contraption you see behind me is how we got the carburetor. <laughs> to know 
want for Christmas. It's an 1867 Roper Steam Velocipede. Look at it. Or just about anything else in this room. Look at everything. This is my favorite part. Excelsior. All right. Now, at one point in time in the USA, the Excelsior brand was one of the top three selling. It was up against Harley Davidson and Indian. Now, who's the person behind Excelsior? Well, it was a Schwinn of the bicycle fame. Isn't that interesting? It's pretty rad. <laughs> completely unrestored and original. This is a 1910 Yale. Um, you can really just stare at it for hours. I'll do a close-up for you, but it's pretty, it's just fabulous. There's actually quite a few unrestored motorcycles around here. I can already see there's the Flying Merkel, which I remember that from my last trip. I actually made a shirt out of it. I had a Flying Merkel printed on my shirt. And uh, we're gonna take a look at that in a second. You're in for a treat. something kind of interesting. Now I knew Sears produced motorcycles. I mean there's not much they didn't produce for a while there but why they were appealing to consumers was because they could purchase and pay in installments. Interesting but really true story the Sears and the Wagner right here this is a 1912 that's 1910 just artwork serious art facts out of this. These scouts are still the preferred motorcycle used for carnival riders, carnival trick riders. from my last visit and it's a hilarious story. So this was intended for military use, okay? Oh, now I'm, I'm gonna digress and get right back to that. So you can see these are wooden wagon style wheels. 
It's a car from 1920, so it's kind of a little bit, that that's the dated aspect of it. But they intended this to be for military use. However, it weighed like 900 pounds. So anytime it got into any kind of mud, it just, just got stuck promptly. It wasn't that helpful and it didn't succeed. But it's so cute and I'm so happy to see it again. back to the Flying Merkle. Like I already said, I remember this from my last visit and I fell in love with it. And who, who wouldn't, all right? So they consider, this is probably, this is unrestored and they consider this the finest unrestored, finest conditioned unrestored Merkle, Flying Merkle in existence. So nice. The majority of this is all original paint and uh, it's great. I'm gonna go ahead and make myself another Flying Merkel shirt, to be honest. Interesting thing is, so, flying, the Flying Merkel was out of some tiny little town called Middletown in Ohio. And it was very innovative for its time. Harley-Davidson board track racer right behind me. So Harley-Davidson actually overpriced this so that it wouldn't sell in any of its showrooms. That way they can maintain complete control over it for their board track racing crew. And that crew actually ended up being nicknamed the Wrecking Crew. enjoyed this as much as I did. This place is just a genuine gym here in the U.S. It's phenomenal. It's just ugh. So let's hope my <laughs> the next time I don't have another six year gap in between my visits. And you should really come check out the Barber Vintage Motorsports Museum. Really check out any museum that's in your area because the more you support them the better. Obviously I'm automotive and motorcycle centric. That's kind of my thing. So if you go anywhere on vacation, just, you know, put in Google, hey, is there a car museum nearby? Go and support them. And that's my PSA for today. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful day.